I went to school for just long enough to be told that a picture tells a thousand words, so I was just going to stand up here and slide through some slides. But I got here this morning, looked in here, and I've seen a family photo one, but my son's missing off here. He's been cropped out, so uh, a picture doesn't tell everything. So uh, apologies to Blake on there. Um, a couple of parts. I'll just talk a little bit about... Um, where we're at today as far as um, farming um, and then with a bit of stuff, a wee bit of um, sort of a wee bit similar story to some things that Dan was talking about, tweaking uh, some management systems and things. Um, with no family farm succession for us, um, I'll just talk a little bit about our background um, and what we've done to be running a farm business but not owning any land. Um, I grew up in a, in a family, farming family in various parts of Otago. I got my first full-time job as a farmhand when I was 17 with Robin and Stuart Stevenson at Clark's Junction. This was a 4,500 acre sheep and beef farm. I was a sole employee. I gained a lot of experience tractor driving, handling large mobs and making a few careless mistakes. Um, things that you don't forget in a hurry. It was a good grounding, and I think a lot of you would be the same. Uh, you learn a lot of life skills in your first job. I was there for three and a half years. Uh, that was my first two dogs. I then moved to Pam and Bill Rutherford's at Culverton. Montrose is a 12,000 acre sheep and beef property, and a larger property meant I was in a team environment for the first time. In the first year or more, I learned a lot about stock handling, reporting back about feed levels, handling dogs and horses from the stock manager, John Harrington. After John left, Bill started getting me to make decisions on stock movements, day-to-day -day planning. And without even realising it, within 12 months, I was basically stock managing 20,000 stock units. Bill showed a great deal of faith in me and guiding me through this transition from shepherding to stock managing. I had an outstanding relationship with Bill and Pam and stayed there for five and a half years. While I was at Montrose, Bill suggested I go away overseas somewhere for three months in the winter. To have an employer encouraging me to go and experience something new and have a job open to me, uh, that meant a lot. We were approached and invited to an interview by David and Rosemary Morrow in Mid Canterbury. They were looking for a manager who might be interest, interested in becoming some sort of equity partners. Becky and I accepted the job, but we wouldn't be starting for another 18 months. Becky had nine months left of her practical to become a qualified accounting technician, and I finished that time at Montrose, and then we went overseas for nine months. This was another example of an employer not trying to stop us with our short-term plans. So we moved to Mount Summers. Here's a modern term, a WTF moment. <laughs> so with a working lead-in period, Becky and I and the Morrows agreed on setting, setting up an equity arrangement where we bought shares in a company which owned the stock and plant and operated the farm. The company leased the land off a family trust. An equity partnership allowed the Morrows to have a stable management situation with someone motivated with skin in the game. Becky and I, at the same time, Becky and I were building some equity in a company and a vested interest in a profit a vested interest to have in a profitable business. I learned a lot from David with his basic but very astute farming practices, practices and he showed his support with me tweaking management. During this time Becky worked off farm for a number of years before starting a family. Having a double income over these years and keeping personal expenses low was a big factor in building cash reserves. We were at the Morrows for about 11 years. We were approached by Elspeth and Charles Jane to see if we would be interested in leasing their property. Cravendale was a 500 hectare rolling downs to medium hill sheep and beef property. 
So we took on a lease in 2012. To have two parties who were realistic about expectations with rentals, outcomes, and similar philo philosophies in how we all wanted Cravendale to be farmed was a great start to our relationship. But at the same time, understanding that some management things will be different. One of the main differences to most leases that we know of is that we lease most of the stock off the Jones as well as the land. 2012 was the year when top two dues cracked $300. Mixed age ewes were 200 plus. Beef was high and so cows were worth a lot too. So buying stock on an absolute high would be a huge risk for us to sell at a set date in several years time. So leasing stock was a huge risk lessening factor for us. So a numbers in and numbers out arrangement was agreed. Another difference is we live off farm. So we bought a house in the local village, so instead of having money tied up in stock, we have money in a house. The Merritt-Jane relationship. It's hugely important to understand each other's expectations and it must work for both parties. If things were too one-sided, someone would end up getting annoyed and the relationship would break down. The fact that we still enjoy each other's company after outside of business after five years is a testament to a good relationship. Running your own business as a husband and wife team is hugely rewarding. And I certainly wouldn't be in this position without Becky contributing equally over a long period of time. So although we don't own any land, we've tried uh, several times to buy small parcels of land, unsuccessful. Um, but just to recap, like we don't own our own land, but we're still running a farming business. Um, and it's, as I said before, it's hugely rewarding. Other key people that we have relationships with, well, I'll just go through that if you want, but you've probably read it. Um, yeah, so yes, so there's the farm, some rough farm details, 27 ewes, 800 hoggets, 170 beef cows, some heifers. We, our policy is selling uh, wieners, calf wieners. Um, finished most of our lambs, but not all, and our lambing and calving percentages there. Another um, key relationship we have is uh, with someone called Chris Mulvaney. We met Chris and become involved with Stock Care while at the Morrows. Stock Care is a monitoring and measuring system with the main emphasis on the ewe flock. The ewe flock is our main engine room of our business and Chris has taught me to really understand our flock. What are the key drivers? What are the limitations and what are the consequences of how we treat our ewes at certain times of the year? Although we were doing a lot of good stuff, I probably didn't really understand what would happen to production if we did certain things with body condition at certain times of the year. With stock care, you can pinpoint a time of year when things go wrong and set a plan in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And likewise, if things go well, just repeat it. Blaming the weather is not an option. If we have cold hard facts of our U body conditions throughout the year, we can plan to avoid having disappointing surprises that affect the bottom line. Other important people, Stuart once said to me, you don't have to know everything, just get advice from the appropriate people. And some examples, but not limited, are agronomists, stock agents or drafters, vert reps, accountants, contractors, employers, ag research, um, a hoggett grazer, our, we'll talk about our hoggett grazier, but he's an, they're another uh, important relationship for us. And for myself, I didn't, uh, didn't go to Lincoln, so I had a few holes in my technical knowledge that I could have picked up at Lincoln, um, but by getting advice from a lot of these other people, um, you can certainly fill in those holes over time. So um, I certainly don't discourage going to Lincoln, I'm not trying to say that, but 
if you've sort of haven't gone down that route, you can uh, can learn those things later on. I just sort of want to go on to some some management things we do. Some things have changed. Carry over cows, store lambs to finishing, hog it grazing away, winter ewe management, stock observation, and an autumn changeover. To go back a slide, we try to run an uncomplicated system. Um, we try to stick to the basics and farm to the strengths and some limitations of a lease and the farm type. We've adapted and made some of these changes. Carry over cows. In the first year, we took advantage of a real growthy summer before we took over and grazed a lot of carryover cows. We had uh, 250 R2s short term and 160 carryovers for 12 months. This was to get on top of high bulk but lower quality feed. The following year, we reduced this number significantly and started building up our own beef cow numbers. We no longer run carryovers because they've done the job required and our beef cows can now take care of the surpluses. After two years of selling store lambs in January, we found that we were falling short of our financial goals. So we invested in converting 24 hectares into a finishing type pastures. At a cost of 20,000, we made that back in the first few months of grazing. In one year, we'd gone from finishing 15% of our lambs and storing 85% to totally flipping that figure upside down. There were a lot of other contributing factors within the U flock to make this a success, um, such as U body condition, feeding levels, and therefore an improved weaning weight. And that year that we flipped those figures around uh, was a dry summer, that's 2014, 2015. I believe that setting up a management system within a finishing unit is more important than the type of forage you use, so long as it suits your, your, um, your farm type or your, your soils and, and climate and those sorts of things. And what I mean by that is um, we all hear the stories of, uh, oh, I put a paddock of such and such in and, oh, it didn't really work and put a whole lot of lambs in there and run out of feed and I took them out two weeks later. Um, that's not really a system. It's just putting a paddock or something and it didn't really work. So we wanted to put in a big enough area that we can um, have it subdivided. We can go bang, bang, bang. Once stock go into that finishing system, they stay there until they off to the works. Um, we didn't do any trials with a paddock here or there. People have already done that. It's nothing new we're doing. Um, so we wanted to go in, hit the ground running and set up a system around that. We chose uh, clover plantain. Um, supposedly a three year crop. Um, so we liked that instead of uh, like a rape type forage where it'd be uh, one, one season. So we went for clover plantain. It's more of an all rounder than some of the other things. Uh, we do lamb on it, so we need it in the spring. Uh, we talked to plenty of people, it's worked for them. Um, we put Balencia clover in there, um, which is an annual, annual clover, annual white, um, and that gave us a good, le uh, good legume in that first couple of grazings, um, and then the, the other white clover can come through after that. In that first season, we finished 1,800 lambs on that 24 hectares, and if you do the math, you'll think, well, that sounds a bit crazy. Um, but they all went all the, on there at once, so we'd do five, or put 800 on there for initially. As some got killed, more come in. Nowadays we're moving uh, more to red clover. Um, we find we can get even better growth rates in lambs. Um, the downside is that it's a bigger window, we can't use it in the winter, or it's not growing in the winter, but we're now growing some uh, a winter crop which can take some of that slack. Our hoggets, 
we graze our hoggets away down country for 16 to 20, 20 weeks um, from June and through to early spring. That leaves more feed for use, particularly in early spring. And at the end of the August, those hoggets are on young grass and really humming, which is probably a good six weeks of where we could get them humming at home. Comes at a cost, but we get a good product at the end of it, and we recoup our grazing costs with uh, hogget lambs. So we made about 60% of our hogget lambs. We could pinpoint through stock here that we were letting our ewes down in the middle of winter. So we now grow a winter crop for some of our ewes to try and set up a good udder and lactation. We were all grass wintering on older pastures. We were concentrating on not losing weight at mating time. And we could lift feed levels at the end of pregnancy but there just wasn't enough quantity or quality in the middle part. So we started growing fodder beet for about 13 or 1400 middle age ewes um, with the plans to last 60 days. So the reason for beet, it's a bulb crop, so we like a bulb crop for snow risk. It's a smaller area needed, it's high quality. Um, it's a smaller area to regrass at the end because um, having a smaller area and bare ground in the spring is uh, pretty important. Springtime for us would be our crunch period. Um, although we do get dry sometimes a little bit in the summer, we're generally pretty summer safe. Um, and to the, with the regrassing sort of side of it too, it's, it's not viable with a lease to regrass large areas of the farm if we, if we don't have to. Lambing and calving dates. We're lambing our ewes on the 25th of September and calving cows on the 20th. A lot of people say, gee, that's late. Um, but I want to have feed under them when they drop. Um, quantity is the, is the key in the spring, not quality, because spring feed is, spring grown feed is quality anyway. So we want to have some feed under their feet because if we miss that peak lash lactation, we'll never make it up. Cool, that's several different things. I'll put uh, stock observation here, um, stockmanship, whatever you like to call it, but a really low cost way of improving things. Um, just understand some basic stock behaviours. Observe your stock. Are they settled? Are they beating you out the gate when you go there? Are they noisy? Have they been wandering? There's all signs of stock not happy. Um, probably signs of the, they're hungry. Um, you know, observe your stock when they're going through a gateway. Are they, is their tail enders? Is the young stock? Are they looking wormy? Um, just some of those basic things that can have, have an impact, I believe. Um, and the best way of improving the average is to improve the bottom. Um, and just to find a balance, everything's about balance. Um, to find a balance between stock production and pasture management um, is something we're always striving to do. Something called uh, autumn changeover. So early April is a time when we're uh, goodbye to the old season's lamb crop. Next year lamb crop be begins. Um, and what I mean by that is we get to a time where it doesn't matter if there's still some lambs to be finished, they've got to go. Um, and that's sort of where some of our store lambs come in. From now on that feed must go into breeding, breeding ewes or hoggets. To use capital stock, or to use feed, or pinch feed from your capital stock on works lambs uh, could impact significantly on next year's mating performance. Some other things we're prepared to do in the autumn, um, like I say in a dry autumn, we're prepared to graze hoggets even earlier, if it means uh, looking after our capital stock, and we've done that in the past. We're prepared to feed barley to use in a dry autumn, which we've done in the past. Um, and another thing we 
we set up to do in the spring is we'll lamb our old ewe separate. They've been mated to terminal size. Uh, we would be prepared to sell them with lambs at foot, but we haven't actioned that yet. So it's sort of kind of like that 80 20 rule. We'd be prepared to drop 20% out uh, to feed the other 80% better. So some key points out of that, relationships with the right people, understanding the key drivers of production and working to our strengths and like the photo suggests, enjoy it. Thank you. Alrighty, so you've got some really good things to think about there. Um, I think uh, Tony's quite amazing because he he uh, is one of those people that uh, is not afraid to try new things, but is also quite prepared to just sit back and look and think hard before he makes a decision. And I think it's pretty clear in his um, in the way he farms his property. There's also for those of you that were here before, there's a lot of key messages there that are very similar to what Dan was talking about. So the floor is yours, people. Questions. Yeah, Tony, um, in the equity partnership you had, after you, was it five years you were in there, after you left it, how, how much more equity did you come out with and um, how much better off were you? Um, let's say how we put that. Um, yeah, no, definitely better off. Um, for an example, I mean, I don't know what managers are on that nowadays, but um, yeah, we feel we'll definitely come out um, quite significantly better off than, a, than, than say, a manager. Um, yeah, if, if you don't mind, I'll just sort of leave it at that. Yeah, we were there for uh, yeah eleven years on that equity partnership. Yeah, yeah. Where was the growth? Um, just in the in the in the company, um, we did get some growth from. Uh, we talked about uh, that was a twenty twelve was a year when we exited that and started our lease. So there was uh, some capital gains in. Um, uh, and some stock that we, in our share of the stock, and also just the, the business had got stronger over that 10 year period. Um, oh, yeah, well, just while that's waiting, when we um, set up our finishing system to, um, uh, it was all about planning. We sort of we didn't just sort of think next week. Oh, we might spray out some paddocks. We uh, planning started six months earlier, and uh, set up a timeline. Fifth of September, sheep have got to be out of there. Ten days later, the spray tr spray trucks there, such and such date drilling. Um, our agronomist needs to be there two days later after emergence and all those sorts of things. Setting up a timeline and a plan in place um, to make sure that you didn't fall behind on. Uh, setting up a, a wee finishing system. Uh, Tony, can you just explain a bit more about how you didn't buy into the stock when you took over the lease? Because I think that's a real key message for me, is you can go in there at a high stock price and get burnt when you come out of the lease. So yeah, I think if you could go over that a bit more, it would be good. Yeah, um, there's pretty much in a nutshell, that was that, like a risk of buying uh, use on, on that absolute high year. And in the last five years, they haven't been that high again. Um, and so that was just going to be a huge risk. We could work five years, sell our use, and use five years for nothing, really. Um, so it was agreed that it was a set number of uh, ewes and cows and hoggets. Um, it was an, as a, a numbers in, numbers in, so we had X a number of uh, mixed age ewes we took over from the Janes. So many hoggets, so many tutus, etc. Um, so when we exit, those same numbers will go back, so we just can't go give them two and a half thousand old ewes back. Um, so we just keep the age structure there. Um, the Janes said to us, we can change genetics if we like. Um, we'll be trying to improve things, so you know we're, we're not going to let things slip if we can help it. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a risk lessening option. I mean, I, I know we may not get the the highs that you could get from selling at the right time. But we're just taking out that risk of the lows. Um, hope that sort of explains it. 
Yep, yes, yeah, so Charles J Jane's here who we lease the farm off. And um, yeah, if, if there's any questions there, might Thanks. be. Thanks. Yeah. Look, um, the whole lease started on a conversation with David. I had a chat to David prior to that. You know, again, it was sort of lead time. I knew that things were changing on the Morrow's farm, that Penny and her husband were coming home, and that Tony would be looking to move, possibly. And I asked David how would he feel if we approached Tony. We ended up essentially the three of us working out things and we've all seen like i was saying to someone before we've all seen people take a lease on by use you know i'm talking 20 years ago for 100 bucks and sell them three years later for 50 and make a might make a cash profit each year but make a loss overall um and uh from me that relationship thing at the top is the key we want them tony and becky a great couple to do well out of it, you know, to endeavour to do well out of it. Um, but the, in answer to the bailment agreement which we've got with the lease, with the stock, uh, there's a fair bit of trust from the owner's perspective on that, but we've observed Tony and Becky for years and we basically trust them to do the right thing. Um, and we were prepared to agree to that situation. Tony bought a few old ewes, but apart from that, just at least we came to an arrangement on the rest of it. Yeah, thanks. That's good, Charles. I couldn't quite see you from the front, so I was pleased you were here because I think that that's a key thing um, in, in this whole relationship for both with Morrows and with the Janes is it's, it's about people and it's about having good relationships with those people and that's what's made this work and will hopefully continue to make it work in the, in the future for Tony. Um, there was some questions earlier on about feeding your fodder beet. Um, Dan feeding fodder beet to use. How are you finding that transition? Yeah, so the first year we did it, um, spray contractor and things probably got a bit annoyed with me, but did it over a couple of, split a couple of paddocks in half, or a bit under half actually. Um, and so it had beet in part of the paddock and still had grass in the other part of the paddock. Um, so even when we were transitioned, even right through, uh, we had beat, they were two day beat breaks, but each day they were getting roughly sort of two or three hundred grams of grass a day as well, and some hay, um, which was pretty easy to do when you had a, they could just sort of go over there and get your grass, let them into there, and then they could sort of walk back to the beat sort of thing, so it was pretty easy to manage, just a few extra fences. Um, the transition period was uh, coming from a next door paddock, we were putting them on for a few hours a day. On about day three or four, I was uh, watching them come off, watching them through the gate, and I thought some of those ewes don't look happy. They just behavioural, they just they weren't they just looked a bit crook in the guts, a bit slow, and just sort of didn't look looked a bit down in the ears. And I think yeah, yeah, you've had a bit of a gutsful. So I just uh, paused it for a day, didn't put them back the next day, just still gave them their grass and all the rest of it. Um, so, but I could sort of pick duly on that. They just had a bit of a bellyache, I think. And I asked the scanner at scanning time, did you notice anything? Has anything gone wrong? You know, with sort of absorbing lambs. And he said, no, there's nothing. I didn't notice anything there. So I thought, well, I might have got away with that. Um, but, yeah, once once we just on and off, but it, we just sort of always had, to, they got a bit of grass as well. So um, didn't have a problem. Um, found the U condition. They, they kept it good and... Appeared to have a good auto development, um, plenty of energy. I can't believe how quiet you people are. Sure, there's some more questions. Paul's got another one. So, Tony, what's the next step for you guys to keep growing your business and, and, your, and your capital? How are you going to do that? Um, it's a very hard question. Um, Look, um, we need to sort of try and work out where we want to where we want to go from here. I mean, we've got some ideas and things. Um, buying land of this sort of scale is probably going to be uh, a bit too far for us. We've been trying to buy small bits of land that we could run in conjunction with this. Um, failing that, you know, we'll f we'd like to keep our options open. Um, Maybe equity partnership with, with land ownership involved, perhaps. Um, 
more uh, other leasing arrangements. We just need to keep our, our options open. Um, yeah, we're always just uh, ears and eyes, and we've got no f hard and fast answer to that. Tony, your hogget grazing, can you go into a bit of detail about your hogget grazing, where they're grazing and um, what's the contracts sort of are and if they're lambing or not? Yep, um, so uh, we found just through a, a, um, a rep, a guy that he knew of, um, we sent our hoggets down there uh, early June, now we're mating, not mating all of them, um, mating sort of around about 60% of them. Um, once made, sometimes they've still got the ram out, so they might be in two different different mobs for a start, but then they just go back together, um, spend their time there together, uh, just a per week basis. Um, so, yeah, just a yeah, straight out per week basis, we keeping the lambs and things, yeah. They're coming home to lamb, yeah. Um, sometimes uh, the unpregnant ones, depending on our spring, we're quite happy to keep them away a wee bit longer if we have to, um, if things are a bit tight at home, so that those ewes at home and hoggets um, have got what they need. Um, we'll just dictate a coming home for those other few round feed levels in the spring. Uh, just, uh, yep, you know, built up a bit of trust over three or four years, um, but I'm down there, I'm doing the animal health, so I'm uh, sort of down there with them um, a few times, scanning, uh, duck down, have a look, um, we're weighing, uh, we sort of know what they are when they go away, we know what they are when they come back, uh, and just observation, yeah. As, um, yeah, like there's certainly, I can just ring up and say, oh, I'm going past, can I call and have a look, and there's no problem. Yeah. I don't. I haven't been down and sort of measured how much they're getting each day or anything like that. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, um, Tony, it's it's pretty awesome because you've talked a lot about relationships and how the people make a difference. And I think in everything, the hog at grazing away, the farm business that you run. The fact that you are running a farm business without having to own land is the key. You don't have to own land to be a farmer. Um, and there's a very large part of this business that isn't here today, um, and that's Becky. Um, and she's got a huge input into making this whole thing work um, and does a lot of the stuff behind the scenes as well as on farm. Doing um, the breaks today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's usually why you only get one half at something. <laughs> Um, so, in actual fact, I'd, I'd like you all to thank Tony very much. I think there's some really key messages that have come out of that about relationships and uh, observation and keeping an eye on things. And, and that's my take home message for, for today, certainly. Um, so, can you all thank Tony, please? <laughs> and the key now is uh, we're going to have afternoon tea. So, we're all going to head downstairs. Um, for afternoon tea and we have got about half an hour for afternoon tea. I've forgotten the honey too for Tony. That's all right. Um, now you got me up here, you can't get rid of me. Um, the hogget grazing away, um, it's probably not unlike uh, what a dairy farmer does um, and a lot of the similar reasons. Uh, why do they send their heifers away grazing? It's to, yeah, one, to grow them out and it's to ensure that in the springtime they've got enough feed on their platform for lactating animals. Um, and it's a s pretty similar reasons to why we do it with our hoggets. We're just trying to set up, everything's about setting up that spring, that short window that we've got, a few months in the spring, everything hinges on that. So um, we're trying to do anything we can to make sure that spring period is, uh, is ticking over nicely. And, and that's that's something that you know that I've always reinforced consulting too is is you have a very small window from when those lambs are weaned to when your ewes are mated, and that is absolute crunch time for next year. And anything you can do to help your ewes be um, milking well is is going to make you money out the other end. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Tony, so much. Thank you.